Cyrus is dead. Zana has chosen exile. But the Atlas of Worlds remains a beacon for Eldritch Horrors. We imprisoned the Elder. We placated the Maven. We've been preparing for the arrival of another. But we never expected Thor. They embody insatiable hunger, crushing darkness, searing flame, merciless wrath. If we don't stop them, they will consume everything. This is a war for our very existence. Stand with us, or we will all perish. The events in Siege of the Atlas take place after the defeat of Cirrus. With Zana leaving to pursue her own agenda, Commander Kerrick has taken responsibility for defending the Atlas and Rayclast against whatever eldritch horrors might arrive. Because Oriath was decimated by both Katava and then Cirrus, Kerrick has moved several map devices to an isolated island in the Kurui Archipelago and has established a militia in order to prevent another event like the Cirrus incident. In this expansion, you will join Kerrick's militia and will be asked to scout the front lines of the Atlas for threats. After encountering the Maven, you will learn that two more eldritch horrors like her or the Elder are on their way to the Atlas. Unlike her though, their intentions are driven by the need to consume absolutely everything they encounter. You must learn what you can do about these entities and attempt to prevent the existential threat they pose to Rayclust. In Siege of the Atlas, the two new eldritch horrors are the Searing Exarch and the Eater of Worlds. These are similar to other pinnacle Atlas bosses of the past, such as the Elder, the Shaper, the Maven, and Cirrus. You will hunt down these two bosses and their sub-bosses, the Black Star and the Infinite Hunger. You will be able to pursue both Eldritch Horrors at the same time, but you can choose which you are pursuing on a map-by-map -map basis. In mid-tier maps, you'll randomly encounter the influence of either the Searing Exarch or the Eater of Worlds. The Maven understands the threat that these Eldritch Horrors pose to her plans. She will modify your map device so that when entering maps, you can choose to add either the influence of the Maven or any Eldritch Horror you have encountered. As you run subsequent maps influenced by the Searing Exarch or the Eater of Worlds, the amount of influence monsters in those maps increases as that Eldritch Horror gets closer to you. Eventually, you'll encounter either the Black Star or the Infinite Hunger, one of the sub-bosses. You must defeat that boss in order to continue progressing closer to the horror you are pursuing. These bosses have exclusive new unique items in their drop pools. You're likely to have encountered the influence of both horrors by this point and can choose which one you're pursuing in each map. Finally, in the highest tiers of maps, you will encounter the Searing Exarch or the Eater of Worlds themselves. If you are able to defeat these extremely difficult foes, they can drop their own exclusive new unique items and eldritch currency items, which we'll describe later in the livestream. Once you have slain the Searing Exarch or the Eater of Worlds once, you can then farm them. In order to do so, you must complete a series of tier 14 or above maps with that eldritch horror's influence applied. You'll eventually find a key that allows you to challenge the Black Star or the Infinite Hunger again. As this key to the fight is tradable, it's not a strict requirement that you slay this first boss, but the item rewards will strongly encourage you to do so. 
After continuing to farm Tier 14 or higher horror-influenced maps, you will receive another tradable key to fight the Searing Exarch or the Eater of Worlds, giving you another shot at their exclusive rewards. The keys to the farmable versions of these bosses can be rolled like regular maps, but with their own mod pool. This allows you to control the difficulty and rewards even further. Earlier, I mentioned that maps can be influenced by the Searing Exarch or the Eater of Worlds. Before we move on, I wanted to go into more detail about what that actually means. In influence maps, as you defeat enemies, altars themed around the Searing Exarch or the Eater of Worlds occasionally appear where you kill those enemies. These altars give you the choice between two options that can either modify your character, influenced monsters, or the boss of the map by increasing rewards but also increasing difficulty. You can encounter multiple altars per area, so sometimes you can drastically affect the difficulty and rewards of a map as you play through it. It's also fine to ignore it and choose not to increase the difficulty and reward of the map if you feel that it's already challenging enough. An example of a modification is altering the map boss so that all of its damage shocks, but also causing it to drop an additional Eldritch currency item as a reward. We'll explain what these new currency items do later in the livestream. In the last iteration of the Atlas, you needed to use Watchstones to both unlock new maps and raise the level of maps across your Atlas. This required grinding conquerors and managing the optimal placement of 16 different Watchstones. In Siege of the Atlas, we've removed Watchstones and have restored the hidden maps back to the base Atlas so they don't have to be unlocked over time. We've added much of the power from craftable Watchstones to Atlas passives so that you can still access the benefits you're used to without the busy work of managing Watchstones. Despite the era of Watchstones being over, we do really like the ability to raise the tier of maps on your Atlas, so that eventually all of them are tier 16. To this end, we have introduced Void Stones. You can earn up to four of these, one each from the Uber Elder, the Maven, the Searing Exarch, and the Eater of Worlds. Placing Void Stones on your Atlas will raise the tier of all of its maps, eventually making them uniformly tier 16. In Siege of the Atlas, we've removed the concept of Atlas regions entirely. This means that we're saying goodbye to regional Atlas passive trees and hello to a single gigantic Atlas passive tree. Ah, good old Path of Exile. This new tree has over 600 passives available to choose from and you can earn 117 Atlas passive skill points by completing your Atlas. Each different map you complete the bonus objective of grants you one skill point. You can also earn some extra ones by completing the Maven's multi-boss fights. Whenever you allocate an Atlas passive skill, its stats apply to every map you run anywhere on the Atlas. Also, because it's much faster to complete earlier maps on the Atlas, your Atlas point acquisition is pretty front-loaded, letting you quickly establish an Atlas layout that helps you find and profit from your favorite content. We've integrated some skills from past regional Atlas trees and have created several new ones like Secret Operations, which turns some of the strongboxes you encounter into a new type of strongbox that drops scarabs. Corrupted Gaze causes Abyssal Jewels to sometimes drop Corrupted with 5 or 6 modifiers rather than a typical 4. Ghastly Devotion guarantees that areas that contain Ritual Altars will always contain 4 Altars. Having one massive Atlas tree means that you can deeply specialize in certain types of content without being limited to what was available in a specific region. You can increase how often you encounter your favorite content and can adjust how challenging and rewarding that content is. The removal of Atlas regions means that you have more freedom to run the maps you like without being forced into regions of the Atlas that are passives that affect the content you wanted to play. The topic of map drops is also important here. Powerful characters are capable of playing very juiced maps, which results in them finding a lot of items, including more maps. Often, they get more maps than they actually need. Weaker characters have to be more careful with what mods they add to their maps and hence find fewer maps. This new Atlas tree lets you choose how much you want to invest in a map tier upgrade that used to be the Atlas completion bonus, which means that powerful characters who don't need extra maps can instead focus those points on improving the rewards from content they play. On the other hand, weaker characters can invest in finding better maps and can then respec this later on once they're finding a surplus. We'll make the full tree available next week so that you can start planning before Siege of the Atlas launches. Every large Path of Exile expansion needs a new way to create the most powerful items in the game. Siege of the Atlas introduces a new endgame item mechanic called Eldritch Implicit Modifiers. A problem we had with the old Shaper, Elder, and Conqueror influence system was that while the items were extremely powerful, they had to be crafted using highly specialized and complicated methods. 
A regular influenced item you found on the ground usually wasn't of much value, unless it was a certain base type at a specific item level. Influenced items were generally not that useful in early, mid, or even most high-end maps, as they were basically a post-endgame feature. Our new system of Eldritch Implicits allows you to apply Eldritch mods to already good items that you have, so that you have a lot more freedom to choose how you create your best items. You can also start interacting with Eldritch Implicits much earlier in your mapping experience. As you know, Path of Excel items can have an implicit mod that either comes built into the item based on what type it is, or can be modified with systems such as Vile Corruption. Eldritch Implicits replace existing implicit mods, but with a twist. An item is allowed to have one Eldritch Implicit from the Searing Exarch and one from the Eater of Worlds at the same time. These Implicits have many different tiers and several ways to interact with them. While playing maps in Siege of the Atlas, you may find some new currency items. Eldritch Ember and Eldritch Ica, corresponding to the Searing Exarch and the Eater of Worlds, respectively. These currency items can be applied to gloves, helmets, body armors, or boots, and overwrite the item's regular implicit mods with new ones from two special pools of powerful modifiers. As I mentioned before, an item can have both a Searing Exarch implicit and an Eater of Worlds implicit at the same time. Applying the same type of orb multiple times will overwrite the appropriate mod with a new random one. These gloves have a single Eldritch Implicit mod which grants you the ability to gain Rage on hit, rate limited by a cooldown. There are two Eldritch Implicit mods on this helmet. The first one simply grants some added fire damage with spells. The second Implicit causes enemies within a radius near you to be unable to regenerate life. Each mod has six tiers of power. The first four tiers come from the four versions of the Eldritch Ember and Ica currency items, while the highest two tiers can only be upgraded to with a special item we'll explain soon. The first tier of Eldritch Ember or Echo drops on all maps and means that any important build-enabling mods are available without having to complete the entire atlas. The second and third tiers come from exploring maps influenced by the Eldritch Horrors, and the fourth tier drops from the Searing Exarch or the Eater of Worlds themselves. You may be wondering how you get access to the fifth and sixth tiers. This requires some luck and planning. The Maven and her encounters have a chance to drop the Orb of Conflict. When used on an item with two Eldritch Implicits, the Orb of Conflict lowers the tier of one Implicit mod and increases the tier of the other. This allows you to manipulate the balance between the two types of Implicits. The best possible outcome is to have a tier 6 and a tier 4 mod at the same time. In order to achieve this, you'd want to apply the highest Eldritch Ember or Eldritch Echo over and over until you have a tier 4 modifier that you want, then use Orbs of Conflict to try to get it to tier 6, before using more Ember and Ica to lock in the tier 4 mod of the other type that you're looking for. We have made sure that the power of these modifiers is available earlier in maps, so that you get access to them when you need them, rather than after you need them. Also, none of the new implicit mods have item level restrictions that prevent them from being applied to an item. There are also conditional versions of Eldritch implicit mods that are only enabled when specific types of enemies are in your presence. These ramp up in power as the condition gets more restrictive. These conditional mods are designed for players who feel that they have sufficient clear speed for easier monsters, and want to specialize in being even more effective against the really tough bosses where it matters. Items with Eldritch Implicits can also have a property of being dominated by one of the Eldritch Horrors. If an item has a higher tier Searing Exarch mod, then it is considered dominated by the Searing Exarch. Conversely, if the mod for the Eater of Worlds is higher tier, then it is considered dominated by the Eater of Worlds. Domination matters for three new currency items we're introducing. The Eldritch Chaos Orb will reroll the prefixes of an item if it is dominated by the Searing Exarch, or the suffixes if the item is dominated by the Eater of Worlds. The same is true for the Eldritch Exalted Orb and the Eldritch Orb of Annulment, which add or remove a prefix or suffix depending on which horror dominates the item. These very rare currency items give you a large degree of control over your endgame rare item crafting if you're able to manipulate the Eldritch Implicits correctly. It's important to note that you can't apply Eldritch Implicit mods to influenced items. By that, I mean items that have the old type of Shaper, Elder, or Conqueror influence. The Siege of the Atlas expansion contains a whole roster of new unique items, which drop from the four new Atlas bosses we have introduced. All of these are powerful uniques, and we'll show you six of them today. The Ashes of the Stars Onyx Amulet increases the level of all of your skill gems and grants them an additional 20% quality. It also improves the reservation efficiency of your skills and lets you level all of your gems faster, which is really useful for gems such as Empower and Enlighten. 
The big booster quality is very valuable with some alternate quality gems, as well as certain skills like curses. The Dissolution of the Flesh Prismatic Jewel changes the way that you interact with incoming damage. While you have this jewel equipped, damage is taken in the form of a temporary reservation to your life pool. If you reserve 100% of your life, you die. This allows you to ignore life recovery completely since the actual amount of life you have left is irrelevant as long as you manage the timing of your life reservation. The Polaric Devastation Opal Ring introduces a new debuff called Covered in Frost and gives you another way to apply the existing Covered in Ash debuff. This is a solid ring for anyone specializing in either fire or cold damage. In a similar vein to Covered in Ash, Covered in Frost causes the target to take 20% increased cold damage and lowers their critical strike chance. The Ceaseless Feast Spiked Gloves have a new debuff called Corrosion, which you can stack up on enemies to remove their armor and evasion. This is not only a great way to reduce their physical damage reduction, but the gloves also have an additional bonus that applies when you have stripped away all of the enemy's armor or evasion. We are also introducing a pair of very rare aspirational unique jewels, Forbidden Flame and Forbidden Flesh. Each of these jewels drops from one of the two new Pinnacle Atlas bosses, and they are certainly unique in that they must work together to unlock their potential. They require the user of the jewel to be a specific class, and they roll with a modifier that specifies a random ascendancy skill from one of the ascendancies of that class. If you are able to equip both a Forbidden Flame and a Forbidden Flesh jewel that specify the same skill, and if you meet the class requirement, then you will be granted that ascendancy skill. For example, if you are a Deadeye and find a Forbidden Flame Jewel that specifies the Master Surgeon skill from the Pathfinder class, then upon finding and equipping a matching Forbidden Flesh Jewel, you will gain the Master Surgeon skill. These jewels open up many new build possibilities for very late endgame characters. The Favored Map System allows you to find more of the maps that you want to play. In the old Atlas, there were three Favored Map slots available to unlock in each region. Now that regions have been removed, Favored map slots can be unlocked by meeting various objectives like completing a tier 16 map or defeating an Elder Guardian. There are 12 favored map slots that can be unlocked. These now apply to all map drops on the Atlas, rather than affecting map drops in just one region. Each slot provides a 10 times multiplier to how frequently its corresponding map drops, relative to other maps. You can select 12 different maps as your favored maps, or you can put the same map type in all 12 slots for a massive 120 times boost to its occurrence in your drop pool. This is particularly powerful once you've socketed all four Void Stones into your Atlas, making all of your maps tier 16, and with a 120 times multiplier applied to a specific map. In this case, the specific map you have chosen will constitute over 50% of all tier 16 map drops. Sextants can be found from tier 14 onwards and are applied to Void Stones. When you use one on a Void Stone, it affects your whole Atlas. Because Void Stones come from the highest tier content, we've removed Simple Sextants and Prime Sextants, as they can no longer be used when you would typically acquire them. We've added the mods from these Sextants to the pool of mods that Awakened Sextants have. Because this dilutes the pool of mods that Awakened Sextants can roll, we've increased the frequency at which you acquire Awakened Sextants. Your existing Simple and Prime Sextants will be converted to Awakened Sextants at the launch of Siege of the Atlas. We have made no changes to elevated sextants. With the new Atlas system as context, we have done a balanced pass of all sextant mods. This resulted in a slight reduction to the amount of content or monsters that a given sextant mod introduces to an area. We have removed the Nemesis Monsters Drop 3 Additional Currency Items mod, both because it's busted, and because it's incompatible with our future plans for the Arch Nemesis League content. We have also added a whole bunch of new sextant modifiers. The general intention behind these new mods is that they give a strong benefit while adding extra difficulty, or reward players for specializing into having other leagues present in an area. For example, there's a sextant mod that ensures that all breaches in an area belong to Chayula. So if you can maximize the number of breaches through scarabs, map device modifiers, the atlas passive tree, or other sextants, then you've got a whole bunch of valuable Chayula breaches in that map. With the removal of watchstones, players would have lost the ability to swap in and out watchstones with different sextant modifiers on them depending on which maps they were running. We like the strategic use of sextants, so we have reintroduced this behavior with a new currency item called the Surveyor's Compass. This can be applied to a void stone with a sextant mod on it to itemize that sextant mod for later use or trade. This currency item drops periodically and is also sold by Kirik for one Chaos Orb, similar to how Einhaas sells Beastery Orbs. There's no limit on how many you can purchase. 
With Zana gone, you may be wondering what is happening to her Atlas missions. Well, Kerrick is taking over from her, but it works a little differently now. Kerrick has assumed the position of commander, and he has important missions for you to carry out in the Atlas. You open these missions at your map device and can run them just like before. However, you won't encounter Kerrick inside a map, and you won't be able to apply Kerrick objectives to a map itself. Because of this, we have raised the chance that you receive a Kerrick Atlas objective when you defeat a map boss. Previously, Zana's missions had completion objectives, but with the removal of the favor system, this stopped mattering. Instead of focusing on completion, Kerrick missions now focus more on rewards, and so their purpose is to provide you with additional league content or extra item drops. Instead of your free daily mission being based on the last map you've completed, it's now based on the highest tier map you've completed in this current league. For example, if you completed a tier 16 map, your daily missions will always be high tier maps. Kerrick missions can now include additional content like conquerors, ritual encounters, expedition encounters, and even monstrous treasure, the former prophecy that makes an area contain 24 to 36 additional strongboxes with no natural monster inhabitants. Kerrick now sells you maps, much like Xana did in the past, except there is now a wider variety of outcomes with variance on the prices, so you should probably go and check what he's selling more frequently in case there's a good deal. The items in the window were re-rolled under the same conditions as Xana's previous shop. Kerrick can sell maps that come with implicit mods enabling various content, for example, a map that always has a legion encounter, or maps that have varying degrees of deliriousness on them. As you play through maps, you'll occasionally find Atlas scouting reports, essentially communication about important missions from other people who scouted the Atlas and didn't survive. These items can be used like a currency item to re-roll the set of mission maps that Kirik is offering you. These new maps have a different set of mission outcomes that includes valuable ones like guaranteeing a unique map, having all maps be corrupted, always including a Shaper Guardian, Elder Guardian, or Conqueror, having only uncompleted maps available, or adding a breach stone to the selection. The value here is not only the re-roll of what is offered to you, but also the guarantee of one or more high-value missions. On the Atlas Passive Tree, you can specialize into finding more Atlas scouting reports or unlocking new types that can drop. Kirik also sells the aforementioned Surveyor's Compass used to itemize sextant mods, as well as everything else Zana previously sold, like specific divination cards. Despite them not being part of the core Atlas experience anymore, it's still possible to fight Cirrus and the Conquerors to take advantage of their influence and unique item rewards. Tier 14 or higher map bosses now have a chance to drop maps influenced by the Shaper, the Elder, or a random Conqueror. You can also purchase these maps from Kirik. When you enter the map, you'll be met with hordes of influence monsters that can drop influenced items. Upon defeating the map boss, a portal will open to the Conqueror's arena. Upon death, the Conqueror will drop a fragment. Each Conqueror has their own fragment. Combine all four fragments in your map device to open a set of portals to the Cirrus encounter. As it's now harder to get influenced items, we've moved plus level gem modifiers into the global mod pool for amulets. So it's now possible to get the powerful plus two levels to certain gems without having to use influenced amulets. Now that Cirrus and the Conquerors are no longer core parts of Atlas gameplay, they will not drop awakened gems. These gems can now drop from Maven invitations. Arch Nemesis is a challenge league that reinvigorates fights with rare monsters. It introduces around 60 new monster mods and allows you to customize your rare boss fights to control your level of risk and reward. These mods can be combined in over 35 recipes to create new, more powerful, and rewarding mods. As you play through the league, you'll discover more recipes and learn how to best utilize them to get the most valuable rewards. When you slay regular rare and magic monsters in the Arch Nemesis League, they sometimes drop an itemized version of a new Arch Nemesis monster modifier. You store these in a dedicated inventory panel so they don't clutter your regular inventory. Over the course of each area you play, you'll encounter four monsters that are frozen in place, petrified and bound to an arch nemesis statue. When you find such a monster, you can free it by empowering it with an arch nemesis mod. If you're able to successfully defeat the empowered monster, then you will receive the fixed reward that corresponds to that modifier. The trick that makes this league awesome is the four petrified monsters per area. You see, the mods you apply will accumulate as you play through the area. When you empower your second monster, it also has the mod you applied to the first monster. This results in a fight that has twice as many dangerous mods and twice as many rewards. Even though you received the reward from the first mod when you killed the first petrified monster, you receive a second reward of that type when you kill the second petrified monster. 
The same applies to the third and fourth fights in the area as well. By the time you defeat the fourth monster, you'll have received the first reward four times, the second reward three times, and so on. Take care when picking what order you consume your mods so that you can maximize your rewards. More than half of the available mods are created by combining other mods together on the same monster. As an example of how this works, if you apply both Incendiary and Hasted to the same monster, then in addition to the rewards that these two mods grant, you will also receive an itemized Flamewalker mod upon killing the monster. This can then be applied to another petrified monster later on to complete further recipes. These recipe mods yield substantially more dangerous encounters and have more valuable rewards. Even if you're not completing a recipe with your modifiers, you can still combine them to get some ridiculous combinations of rewards. For example, defeating an innocence-touched enemy grants three currency rewards and converts all other rewards into currency. Defeating a mirror image enemy grants a divination card reward and rerolls all rewards three times, yielding the rarest result. Killing a flamewalker enemy grants three weapon rewards. Killing a toxic enemy grants a generic reward plus a gem reward. If you were to kill an enemy with all four modifiers, you get a total of nine currency rewards, each rolled three times and dropping the best result. But if you apply the mods in the order mentioned above, then as you kill each of the four monsters in the area, you'll receive the earlier rewards multiple times. The end result is the equivalent of getting 60 currency rewards and receiving the best 20 plus three regular currency rewards. As you can see from this example, even the basic rewards that offer, say, three random weapons are really useful because you can combine them with reward conversion mods to take advantage of their high item counts. We're looking forward to seeing what other types of crazy ways you manage to combine your arch nemesis rewards. To prevent you having to backtrack, there are more than four possible locations where you may encounter petrified monsters in each area, but only the first four you encounter can be empowered and fought. Arch Nemesis mods cannot be traded with other players. Your progress is your own. We designed this league to be a relatively simple one to go alongside all of the new Atlas content in this expansion, and it exceeded our expectations. The fights are fun, the rewards are punchy, and there are a lot of tough decisions about which reward combinations or recipes you can pursue. In Siege of the Atlas, our balanced goal is to take two very common gameplay archetypes that struggle with endgame content and to buff them so that they're in a much better place compared to other builds. The ones we are targeting are hit damage bow characters and hand casting spellcasters. If you haven't checked out the balance manifesto about these changes that we posted recently, I'd encourage you to read all about them in the patch notes that will be posted when the livestream ends. To be clear, this expansion does have a few of the usual nerfs to the most overperforming builds, but for the most part, the majority of balance changes are buffs. The goal is that players who play hit damage bow builds and hand casting spellcasters are significantly more competitive. Alongside Siege of the Atlas, we're introducing two new types of stash tap, one for flasks and one for gems. A side effect of this is that you're able to set your regular tabs to have affinity for flasks or gems, regardless of whether you've purchased the new specialized tabs. The Gem Stash tab allows you to easily store and sort your collection of up to 500 skill and support gems. By default, it displays all gems stored in the tab, but you can use one of the four categories at the top to filter between red, green, blue, and white gems. There's a dropdown that allows you to pick your preferred sorting method, such as current gem level, required level, or quality, to easily find whatever gem you're looking for. The Flask Stash tab allows you to store 500 flasks and can be filtered to show life, mana, hybrid, utility, and unique flasks. You can also use the drop-down to change the sort order between item level, base type, and quality. This allows you to quickly find flasks of a certain type, potential flasks to vendor for glassblower's baubles, or high item level flasks for crafting. Remember that regardless of whether you've purchased these new tabs, you'll still be able to set up affinities for gems or flasks on your existing stash tabs. Alongside the launch of Siege of the Atlas, we are hosting a competitive event where players will race to be the first to kill a trio of bosses the Maven, the Searing Exarch, and the Eater of Worlds. The event will take place in the hardcore solo cell found Arch Nemesis League. We have some interesting prizes in store for the winners. Keep an eye on the news next week for more details about how this event will work and what its prizes are. We're almost at the Q&A, but first I'd like to show you the new supporter packs we're releasing today to help fund development of future Path of Exile expansions. Our new packs are called the Worm and Ember Keep supporter packs. Like our recent League packs, there are three tiers available, each of which include points equivalent to the cost of the pack, plus many exclusive cosmetic microtransactions like apparition effects, armor sets, weapon skins, forum badges, titles, and social frames. 
The Worm series comes with an exclusive pet, and the Emberkeep series comes with an exclusive weapon effect. These new packs are in addition to the 2022 core packs that we released recently. Remember to check those out if you haven't already.